Address of the President to members of the Senate and of the House of Commons in the House of Commons Chamber, Ottawa, Canada, May the 17th, 1961. Mr. Speaker of the Senate, Mr. Speaker of the House, Mr. Prime Minister, members of the Canadian Houses of Parliament, distinguished guests and friends, I'm grateful for the generous remarks and kind sentiments of my country and myself, Mr. Prime Minister. It is a deeply felt honor to address this distinguished legislative body, and yet may I say that I feel very much at home with you here today. For one third of my life was spent in the parliament of my own country, the United States Congress. There are some differences between uh, this body and my own. The most noticeable to me is the lofty appearance of statesmanship, which is on the faces of the members of the senators who realize that they will never have to place their cause before the people again. <laughs> I feel at home also here because I number in my own state of Massachusetts many friends and former constituents who are of Canadian descent. Among the voters of Massachusetts who were born outside the United States, the largest group by far was born in Canada. Their vote is enough to determine the outcome of an election, even, <laughs> even a presidential election. You can understand that having been elected President of the United States by less than 140,000 votes out of 60 million that I am very conscious of these statistics. <laughs> the warmth of your hospitality symbolizes more than may the courtesy which may be accorded to an individual visitor. They symbolize the enduring qualities of amity and honor which have characterized our country's relations for so many decades. Nearly 40 years ago, a distinguished prime minister of this country took the part of the United States at a disarmament conference. He said they may not be angels, but they are at least our friends. I must say that I do not think that we probably demonstrated in that 40 years that we are angels yet but I hope we've demonstrated that we are at least friends. And I must say that I think in these days, where Hazard is our constant companion, that friends are a very good thing to have. The Prime Minister was the first of the leaders from other lands who was invited to call upon me shortly after I entered the White House. And this is my first trip, and the first trip of my wife and myself outside of our country's borders. It is, it is just and fitting and appropriate and traditional that I should come here to Canada, across a border that knows neither guns nor guerrillas. But we share more than a common border. We share a common heritage traced back to those early settlers who traveled from the beachheads of the maritime provinces and New England to the far reaches of the Pacific coast. Henry Thoreau spoke a common sentiment for them all. East would I go only by force. West would I go free. I must walk towards Oregon and not towards Europe. We share common values from the past, a common defense line at present, and common aspirations for the future, our future, and indeed the future of all mankind. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. Economics has made us partners. And necessity has made us allies. Those whom nature has so joined together, let no man put asunder. What unites us is far greater than what divides us. The issues and irritants that inevitably affect all neighbors are small indeed in comparison with the issues that we face together. Above all, the somber threat now posed to the whole neighborhood of this continent, in fact, to the whole community of nations. But our alliance is born not of fear, but of hope. It is an alliance that advances what we are for, as well as opposes what we are against. And so it is that when we speak, of our common attitudes and relationships. Canada and the United States speak in 1961, 
in terms of unity. We do not seek the unanimity that comes to those who water down all issues to the lowest common denominator, or to those who conceal their differences behind fixed smiles, or to those who measure unity by standards of popularity and affection instead of trust and respect. We are allies. This is a partnership, not an empire. We are bound to have differences and disappointments and we are equally bound to bring them out into the open, to settle them where they can be settled, and to respect each other's views when they cannot be settled. Thus ours is the unity of equal and independent nations, co-tenants of the same continent, heirs of the same legacy, and fully sovereign associates in the same historic endeavor to preserve freedom for ourselves and all who wish it. To that endeavor, we must bring great material and human resources, the result of separate cultures and independent economies. And above all, that endeavor requires a free and full exchange of new and different ideas on all issues and all undertakings. For it is clear that no free nation can stand alone to meet the threat of those who make themselves our adversaries, that no free nation can retain any illusions about the nature of the threat, and that no free nation can remain indifferent to the steady erosion of freedom around the globe. It is equally clear that no Western nation on its own can help those less developed lands to fulfill their hopes for steady progress. And finally, it is clear that in an age where new forces are asserting their strength around the globe, when the political shape of the hemispheres are changing rapidly, nothing is more vital than the unity of the United States and of Canada. And so, my friends of Canada, whatever problems may exist or arise between us, I can assure you that my associates and I will be ever ready to discuss them with you and to take whatever steps we can to remove them. And whatever those problems may be, I can also assure you that they shrink in comparison with the great and awesome tasks that await us as free and peace-loving nations. So let us fix our attention, not on those matters that vex us as neighbors, but on the issues that face us as leaders. Let us look southward as part of the hemisphere with whose fate we are both inextricably bound. Let us look eastward as part of the North Atlantic community upon whose strength and will so many depend. Let us look westward to Japan, to the newly emerging lands of Asia and Africa and the Middle East, where lie the people upon whose freight, fate and choice the struggle for freedom may ultimately depend. And let us look at the world in which we live and hope to go on living, and at the way of life for which Canadians, and I was reminded again of this this morning on my visit to your war memorial, and Americans alike, have always been willing to give up their lives in nearly every generation, if necessary, to defend and preserve freedom. First, if you will, consider our mutual hopes for this hemisphere. Stretching virtually from pole to pole, the nations of the Western Hemisphere are bound together by the laws of economics as well as geography, by a common dedication to freedom as well as a common history of fighting for it. To make this entire area more secure against aggression of all kinds, to defend it against the encroachment of international communism in this hemisphere, and to see our sister states fulfill their hopes and needs for economics and social reform and development are surely all challenges confronting your nation and deserving of your talents and resources as well as ours. To be sure, it would mean an added responsibility, but yours is not a nation that shrinks from responsibility. The hemisphere is a family into which we were born, and we cannot turn our backs on it 
in time of trouble, nor can we stand aside from its great adventure of development. I believe that all of the free members of the Organization of American States would be heartened and strengthened by any increase in your hemispheric role, your skills, your resources, your judicious perception at the council table, even when it differs from our own view, are all needed throughout the inter-American community. Your country and mine are partners in North American affairs. Can we not now become partners in inter-American affairs? Secondly, let us consider our mutual hopes for the North Atlantic community. Our NATO alliance is still, as it was when it was founded, the world's greatest bulwark of freedom. But the military balance of power has been changing. Enemy tactics and weaponry have been changing. We can stand still only at our peril. Improved conventional forces and increased nuclear forces are put forward in recognition of the fact that the defense of Europe and the assurances that can be given to the people of Europe and the defense of North America are indivisible in the hope that no aggressor will mistake our desire for peace with our determination to respond instantly to any attack with whatever force is appropriate and in the conviction that the time has come our opponents are watching to see if we in the West are divided. They take courage when we are. We must not let them be deceived or in doubt about our willingness to maintain our own freedom. Third, let us turn to the less developed nations in the southern half of the globe. Those who struggle to escape the bonds of mass misery, which appeals to our hearts as well as to our hopes. Both your nation and mine have recognized our responsibilities to these new nations. Our people have given generously, if not always effectively. We could not do less, and now we must do more. For our historic task in this embattled age is not merely to defend freedom, it is to extend its writ and strengthen its covenant to peoples of different cultures and creeds and colors, whose policy or economic system may differ from ours, but whose desire to be free is no less fervent than our own. As the new nations emerge into independence, they face a choice. Shall they develop by the method of consent or by turning their freedom over to the system of totalitarian control? In making that decision, they should look long and hard at the tragedy now being played out in the villages of communist China. If we can work closely together to make our food surpluses a blessing instead of a curse, no man, woman, or child need go hungry. And if each of the more fortunate nations can bear its fair share of the effort to help the less fortunate, not merely those with whom we have traditional ties, but all who are willing and able to achieve meaningful growth and dignity, then this decade will surely be a turning point in the history of the human family. Finally, let me say just a few words about the world in which we live. We should not misjudge the force of the challenge that we face, a force that is powerful as well as insidious, that inspires dedication as well as fear, that uses means we cannot adopt to achieve ends we cannot permit. Nor can we mistake the nature of the struggle. It is not for concessions or territory. It is not simply between different systems. It is an age-old battle for the survival of liberty itself. And our great advantage, and we must never forget it, is that the irresistible tide that began 500 years before the birth of Christ in ancient Greece is for freedom and against tyranny. And that is the wave of the future. And the iron hand of totalitarianism can ultimately neither seize it nor turn it back. In the words of Macaulay, a single breaker may recede, 
but the tide is coming in. So we in the free world are not without hope. We are not without friends. And we are not without resources to defend ourselves and those who are associated with us. If we can contain the powerful struggle of ideologies and reduce it to manageable proportions, we can proceed with a transcendent task of disciplining the nuclear weapons, which shadow our lives, and of finding a widened range of common enterprises between ourselves and those who live under communist rule. For in the end, we live on one planet, and we are part of one human family. And whatever the struggles that confront us, we must lose no chance to move forward towards a world of law and a world of disarmament. At the conference table and in the minds of men, the free world's cause is strengthened because it is just. But it is strengthened even more by the dedicated efforts of free men and free nations. As a great parliamentarian, Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that, in essence, is why I am here today. This trip is more than a consultation, more than a goodwill visit. It is an act of faith, faith in your country, in your leaders, faith in the capacity of two great neighbors to meet their common problems, and faith in the cause of freedom in which we are so intimately associated.